Welcome to this comprehensive guide on the settings found in the Inverter tab of the Victron V Configure software. It is essential to correctly configure these settings of your V-Bus Inverter Charger, such as the Multi-Plus or Quattro device, so that it works in sync with the grid, as well as to protect your batteries from over-discharging, thereby causing permanent damage to them. Before continuing with this tutorial video, you'll need to first have Victron V configuration tools downloaded and installed on your Windows computer. From there, you will have to connect the Victron MK3 device between your inverter and computer, using a spare USB port as well as a certified UTP cable. If you haven't done so yet, make sure to check out my previous two videos in order to help you get this all done correctly before continuing with this video. With all that said and done, let's now take a deeper look at connecting to and using VE Configure. The Inverter tab of VE Configure is designed to manage how Victron inverters interact with the electrical grid voltage, as well as to manage when it should stop using battery power for the loads. This includes settings such as DC low shutdown, restart and low battery alarms, together with the Power Assist and AES, or Automatic Economy Switch, features. The inverter output voltage setting specifies the alternating current voltage that the inverter will produce and supply to connected devices and systems. This voltage will vary depending on where the system is located in the world. The 100 to 127 voltage range is less common globally and primarily found in North and Central American countries, with a few exceptions. For example, Japan uses 100 volts while Haiti, Cuba, Colombia, and Jamaica primarily use 110 volts. Both the United States and Canada predominantly use 120 volts, together with several countries in Central America like Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, Panama, and the Dominican Republic, typically at a frequency of 60 Hz. Brazil and Mexico's standard voltage is 127 volts, but can vary slightly by region. The 220 to 240 voltage range is more prevalent worldwide. European countries, together with most African, Asian, and many oceanic countries, all fall within this range. For example, China together with Egypt and many of its neighboring countries in North Africa use 220 volts. African countries like South Africa and Nigeria use 230 volts, together with India and the majority of mainland Europe such as France, Germany, Spain, and Italy, who have fully harmonized their electrical standards across the European Union. Sweden and Norway also use 230 volts. However, older installations might still have 220 volts. The UK, Australia, and New Zealand also use 230 volts to align with international standards, but 240 volts is still commonly found in practice. The majority of these countries use a frequency of 50 Hz, except for some like South Korea, who uses 220 volts at 60 Hz. This voltage setting in VE config is therefore crucial, as it must match the voltage requirements of your electrical grid and appliances to ensure compatibility and safe operation. Make sure to check out the complete video guide on how frequency works for more information on this topic. I will add a link to it in the description below. The ground relay is an extremely important component that ensures the safety of your electrical system, particularly when your installation includes an earth leakage circuit breaker. The ground relay allows for the selective connection or disconnection of the neutral wire to the protective earth. This function is particularly important in different modes of operation of the inverter. In inverter mode, with the transfer switch open, the inverter does not receive AC input, Instead, it only supplies power via DC sources such as solar or batteries. When in this mode, the neutral of the inverter is connected to the protective earth, or PE. This connection is vital for safety, ensuring that in the event of a fault, any stray currents are effectively grounded. In AC input mode, with the transfer switch closed, the inverter transfers the received AC input to the output, while disconnecting the neutral from the protective earth. This disconnection is crucial to comply with safety regulations and to ensure that the grounding conforms to electrical standards, preventing any potential ground loop or electrical hazard. In other words, this helps protect against electrical shocks and ensures that any fault currents are safely directed towards the earth, which helps in triggering circuit protection devices like circuit breakers or fuses when necessary. 
For inverter models that operate on 120, 240 volt configurations, often referred to as split phase, and commonly used in North America, the L2, also known as Line 2, represents the second phase. This phase is critical as it provides a part of the 240 volts needed to operate high power appliances, such as dryers, ovens, and air conditioning units. Therefore, if the ground relay were to be deactivated, it might lead to a disconnect or improper functioning of the L2 phase. This is because it would affect the system's ability to properly deliver the necessary 240 volts across the phases. The implications here include potential operational issues or failures for any appliances or systems relying on that 240 volt output. It is therefore best practice to always keep the ground relay enabled especially if your system configuration includes an earth leakage circuit breaker. This ensures that all safety mechanisms are active and effective. All right, so in what scenarios would you actually disable the ground relay? While in the majority of cases, it should not be deactivated, here are a few example outliers where it could be valid. If the electrical system has an alternative method of grounding that is considered safe and compliant with local electrical codes, you might deactivate the inverter's ground relay. This alternative could be a system designed to handle grounding differently due to unique requirements of the installation or to avoid ground loops. In some troubleshooting scenarios, it might be necessary to temporarily deactivate the ground relay in order to isolate and identify issues with the grounding system. This should only be done under controlled conditions, ideally by a qualified technician, to ensure that any potential safety risks are managed. Some specific applications or configurations might require the ground relay to be deactivated in order to meet particular operational criteria. However, this is rare and should only be done based on the manufacturer's recommendations or under the guidance of an electrical engineer who understands the implications. The DC input low shutdown setting in Victron inverters is a crucial configuration that helps protect your battery from being excessively discharged. In case you didn't know, the battery's voltage decreases as it's discharged, reaching a lower state of charge or SOC, while the voltage increases as it's charged, reaching a higher state of charge or SOC. This setting therefore determines the voltage level and thereby the battery's current state of charge, at which the inverter will cease to draw power from the battery in order to prevent damage and extend its lifespan. However, setting the DC input low shutdown correctly is vital for several reasons. A full discharge can cause an imbalance among the battery cells, where some cells may be completely depleted while others still retain some charge. This places stress on the internal chemistry, degrading its ability to hold a charge over time, thereby reducing the battery's overall performance and capacity. When a lithium phosphate battery is fully discharged, its voltage can drop to a level that might be insufficient to even power the BMS, or battery management system. The BMS is crucial for monitoring cell health, balancing charges between cells, and protecting the battery from conditions that could cause damage like overcharging or temperature extremes. Therefore, if the battery's voltage causes the BMS to stop functioning, the battery could be at risk of further degradation or imbalance, as no regulatory or protective measures are actively managing the cells. In severe cases, if the BMS cannot reboot due to extremely low voltage, it can lead to a state commonly referred to as bricking, where the battery becomes unusable. The term derives from the battery being as functional as a brick, which for electrical needs is next to none. If this does occur, it typically requires external intervention, like jump-starting from another battery or a specialized charger, in order to hopefully resurrect the BMS. Completely discharging the battery can even lead to safety issues like overheating in other battery chemistries, such as standard lithium ion cells. The DC input low restart setting is closely linked with the DC input low shutdown. Together, these settings manage how your inverter responds to changes in battery voltage, specifically concerning when it should cease to draw power from the battery and when it should continue. The DC input low restart determines the voltage at which the inverter will reactivate and begin drawing power from the battery after it has previously shut down due to low voltage. The objective here is to ensure the battery has sufficiently recharged before resuming operation, 
thus preventing the battery from an immediate re-discharge under load, which can stress the battery even further. The DC input low restart is typically defined as an offset to the DC input low shutdown setting. This means that the restart voltage has to be set higher than the shutdown voltage in order to allow some buffer for the battery to recover. For example, if the DC input low shutdown is set at 48 volts, then the restart setting might be set at an offset of, say, 2 volts, making the restart voltage 50 volts. This ensures that the battery recharges a bit before the inverter starts drawing power, thus avoiding the scenario where the battery is immediately burdened again. When changing the shutdown voltage in V-Config, it automatically adjusts the restart voltage due to their linked nature. If you set the shutdown lower or higher, the restart threshold adjusts accordingly by the preset offset. By default, V-Config sets the restart voltage at 6.4 volts higher than the value set as the shutdown voltage. As mentioned earlier, you can manually change the restart voltage to any voltage you prefer, as long as it's more than 1 volt higher than the shutdown voltage, such as 49 volts in this case. However, setting the restart voltage too low might not give the battery enough time to recover, potentially leading to reduced battery lifespan due to repeated deep discharges. If you are unsure, key to the recommended 6.4 volts difference provided by V-Config, or from my experience, no lower than a 4 volt difference, which with a 48 volt shutdown setting would result in a 52 volt restart voltage. The reason for this is because a larger restart voltage will also help maintain operational efficiency and ensure that the system is not frequently toggling on and off, which can wear down components. It's essential to refer to the battery's manual for guidance on what to set both the shutdown and restart voltages at. Also note that I am using a 48 volt battery for these example purposes, so if you are running a 24 or 12 volt system, your settings will naturally be different in relation to that. If the battery doesn't provide these details, then you can visit the Victron battery compatibility list at this URL, which in most cases gives the correct details, as well as some other very important setup and configuration information. I will add the link into the video description as well. The DC input low pre-alarm is simply an internal system alert that warns you of a possible low voltage and shutdown before the battery voltage drops to a critical level. The warning will trigger as a notification inside your Serbo's remote console notification section, as well as in your VRM under the Alarm Logs section. This pre-alarm setting is designed to give you advance warning in order to take appropriate action, such as reducing load or preparing for a shutdown, thus protecting the battery from excessive discharge and potential damage. The DC input low pre-alarm is typically set as an offset voltage relative to the DC input low restart level which is set relative to the DC input low shutdown level. This means that the pre-alarm level is indirectly linked to the shutdown level through the restart level. In other words, when you adjust either the DC input low restart or the DC input low shutdown settings, the pre-alarm level automatically adjusts to the same voltage offset as the restart level. However, unlike the low shutdown voltage, the alarm has no guardrails and can even be set lower than the shutdown voltage such as 47 volts with a 48 volt shutdown value. Although this makes no sense as the battery would already be shut down before the alarm triggers. As the pre-alarm setting is dependent on your preference and on site specific requirements, you may wish for this to be activated earlier than the restart voltage, such as 53 volts, if your restart voltage is set to 52 volts. This is useful in an off-grid situation in order to allow time to start a backup generator. If the system is configured in ESS mode, you may not wish to have this alarm trigger until it falls below the sustained threshold voltage of around 50 volts, due to the system being in no real danger at this point, where it should be able to sustain at around 51 volts without needing to trigger an alarm. At the end of the day, the alarm has no influence on the system's functionality. It is purely for your convenience. So set it to whatever suits you or the system best. Remember though that batteries also differ in their voltages in relation to their state of charge. My home system, for example, is at 52 volts when the battery bank reaches 40% SOC, which is why I generally set the alarm to around 51 to 52 volts, as this is ample warning time for me to react and reduce loads before it reaches 20% SOC. 
A good tip is to set the alarm voltage, at least 0.04 volts less than your restart voltage. This is to avoid having a low voltage alert sent to you when the battery restarts after a shutdown. In my case, I set it to 51.96 volts based on my 52 volt restart voltage. You are also able to set up custom push and email notifications through the Victron remote management app. Check out the video in the description for a tutorial on how to do this. Very similar to the DC input low shutdown voltage settings, the low SOC shutdown feature is designed to turn off the inverter when the battery's state of charge falls to a predetermined level. This is particularly useful in scenarios where the battery voltage isn't a reliable indicator of remaining charge, which can be the case with certain battery chemistries or under specific load conditions. One of these chemistries being lithium iron phosphate, which tends to have a flat and sometimes erratic voltage discharge curve in relation to the battery state of charge. Let's again take a look at my 48 volt lithium phosphate system as an example case, with the top graph representing the voltage and the bottom graph representing the state of charge. On the left side, we can see that the voltage is stable and flat at around 54.45 volts, while the batteries are fully charged at 99% as they never reach 100. Then, as the AC input source is disconnected, the inverter draws power from the battery to sustain a constant stable load that I had active for this test. During this transition, we can see a major and sudden drop in voltage, all the way to 52.86 volts, while the battery only lost 2% capacity. From there, the battery voltage enters a period of semi-stability, where its graph shows a much flatter, linear pattern only dropping to 52.74 volts, while the battery capacity drops all the way down to 75%, which causes an inconsistency between the two graphs. The voltage then drops a bit more rapidly to 52.36 volts, as the batteries reach 65% SOC. Then there is another slow linear drop to 52.09 volts, as the batteries reach 40%. At this point, I reactivated the AC input to charge the batteries again, causing the voltage to rapidly spike to 53.05 volts, with only a 2% increase in state of charge. From here, the voltage increases less drastically while following a repeated pattern of smaller, upward-trending, convex graphs, while the state of charge continues to increase at a steady, linear rate. Finally, as the battery enters absorption mode at around 54.37 volts, at 95.8%, the curve changes to a concave graph, before reaching 99% again. So, as you can see, the battery voltage of lithium iron phosphate batteries can be quite erratic, with sudden drops and linear plateaus, all while the battery state of charge follows a much more stable and steady linear pattern throughout. Because of this, SOC monitoring based on column counting, which is tracking the amount of charge entering and leaving the battery, or using an advanced battery management system, is more reliable for lithium iron phosphate batteries than simple voltage-based monitoring that we covered previously. Similar to lithium phosphate, other battery chemistries such as nickel cadmium and nickel metal hydride also exhibit a less pronounced voltage drop during discharge, making voltage-based shutdown less reliable than state of charge shutdown. On the other hand, traditional lead-acid batteries show a clear voltage drop as they discharge, so using the voltage-based shutdown is preferable in their case. Note that when you click to enable this setting, VE config will tell you that you first need to have the battery monitor enabled, which can be found under the general tab. I have already covered this section in depth in a previous video, so make sure to check that out in order to set up the battery monitor correctly. With that done, you can go back to the SOC shutdown settings. When enabled, it's by default configured to shut down the system when the state of charge reaches 10%. Then the system will restart when the state of charge rises back up to 20%, providing a buffer to prevent the battery from immediately re-discharging after a restart. However, to maximize the lifespan and performance of lithium phosphate batteries, it is advisable to maintain a minimum state of charge of 20%. The SOC low restart value needs to be at least 10 to 20% more than the low shutdown state of charge value. In other words, with the SOC shutdown set to 20%, setting the restart SOC to about 30 to 40% is advisable. This gives the battery enough charge capacity for it to reliably operate again without the risk of it reaching 20% soon afterwards, 
causing a second shutdown and further damage. The Do Not Restart After Short Circuit setting is, as it states, a safety feature that prevents the inverter from automatically restarting after detecting the short circuit. While the standard originates in Germany and is mandatory for them, the VDE 2510-2 standard is often referenced and utilized by other countries and organizations due to its rigorous safety and performance criteria. The standard is designed for stationary energy storage systems that are intended to be connected to low voltage grids, focusing on systems that support renewable energy integration and grid stability. The standard specifies detailed safety protocols to ensure the safe operation of energy storage systems throughout their life cycle, including protection against electrical, mechanical, and thermal hazards. Therefore, if the system is in Germany, the setting must be enabled. If you are not, it can optionally be enabled for enhanced safety measures. However, when you enable this setting, you'll see that it actually requires a grid password in order to activate. This shows the importance of knowing exactly what you are doing before proceeding. If you are even the slightest bit unsure, then rather please lead this off. To proceed, you need to enter the following grid password. Also note that when doing this, another important warning appears telling you that in order for the change to take effect, you will need to restart the inverter. Again, please make 100% sure of this before restarting. When a short circuit occurs, the inverter will detect this condition and shut down to prevent potential damage or hazards, unlike other overload conditions where the system might attempt to restart automatically after a short period. This setting ensures that the inverter remains off until manually inspected and reset. The upside of doing this is that it prevents the system from cycling on and off rapidly in the event of a persistent fault, which can prevent further significant damage or pose a safety risk. After a short circuit is detected, the inverter requires a manual reset to restart, preventing automatic re-engagement which might lead to further issues. The downside is that the requirement of a manual restart can be inconvenient if the short circuit was a one-time occurrence and the system needs to be back online quickly. In an on-grid setup where uptime is critical, having the system go offline and wait for manual intervention might lead to unwanted downtime. In summary, if safety and compliance with stringent standards are your primary concerns, enabling the setting is advisable. This is especially true if the system is in a sensitive location where the risks associated with automatic restarts are higher. However, in saying this, ensure that you have adequate monitoring and maintenance protocols in place to quickly address and reset the system if it does shut down due to a short circuit. Then lastly, for systems using sensitive battery technologies, such as lithium phosphate, it might be beneficial to enable this setting to avoid potential damage and ensure longevity of the batteries. When AES, or Automatic Economy Switch, is enabled, the power consumption when there are no or very low loads connected to the inverter is reduced by approximately 20% by slightly narrowing the sinusoidal voltage. This effectively reduces the current drawn from the battery, helping to conserve battery energy. When the load increases, the inverter will switch back to normal mode. Note that switching from no load to full load may take slightly more time when AES is enabled, so it may be advantageous to not enable AES in some applications. The load limits for entering and exiting AES mode, as well as the AES type, can be configured with the following settings. The start limit for low power is the value at which the load must be lower than for a period of time before the inverter will switch to AES mode. The default value is 92 watts. Note that the actual setting inside the device is a current setting in amps rather than a power setting in watts. The program converts this to a power figure for your convenience. With a low load, this results in a significant deviation because there is a small and constant imaginary current which cannot be neglected. The effect is that the actual limit in watts is lower than the setting indicates. Changes in the AES limit settings will become effective after the device is reset by switching the device off and on again using the front switch. Below the start limit is the stop AES when load is higher than setting. The default value for this is 46 watts.
This value is the amount of watts that the load must reach above the set start limit before the inverter will exit AES mode and return to normal operation. Given the start value of 92 watts, we would add 46 watts to it in order to calculate the effective combined stop limit of 138 watts. In other words, when the load exceeds 138 watts, the inverter will switch back to normal mode. While not available on all Victron models, the inverter supports two methods of power reduction when there is no load or a low load connected. Both methods change the output of the inverter. When the modified sine wave is chosen, the inverter changes the wave shake to reduce the RMS value of the output while maintaining the peak voltage. This results in lower power consumption. Make sure to watch this video on system frequency to better understand terms such as RMS and peak voltage. The search mode method further reduces power consumption by switching off the output and periodically turning it on approximately once every two seconds in order to check for a load. If a load is detected, the output remains on. However, this can cause a delay up to about one second before the inverter detects the load, which might be unacceptable for some applications. In such cases, the modified sine wave auction should be chosen. It is important to note that all the AES settings will be ignored when the device is part of a VE bus system. In other words, AES will function only when the device is operating in a standalone configuration. As VE bus is part of the majority of system configurations, it's generally best to leave the setting off altogether. And that brings us to the end of this video. If you've made it this far, I sincerely hope you have enjoyed the content and learned something new. If so, please leave a like and subscribe if you have, as well as to get notified of any future videos. Oh, and make sure to check out this video as well. You can also subscribe over here. And this one is pretty cool too. Lastly, don't forget to visit the Blue Power Pro forum.